Hi, and welcome to Tech Leader TV. I'm your host, John Thomas Flynn, and this is our eighth year of TLTV, and we continue with a stellar lineup of topics and guests, a show that everyone's talking about, a live streaming video webcast and cable television program focusing on public sector information technology and the political landscape. We come to you today courtesy of our sponsors, Unisys, LexisNexis, Xerox, Optum Government Solutions, Nexus, a dimension data company, Veeam, Comcast, Microsoft, Tanium, Kronos, Information Builders, and Absolute Software. And finally, Flynn Cossigan Associates, a California certified small business enterprise and trusted advisors for strategic IT business development, marketing, and solution services. And thanks for watching Tech Leader TV. Our website continues to set new audience records. We're reaching thousands of state IT decision makers and vendor partners who have now recorded 250,000 page views last month alone. A quarter of a million. Congratulations. And we have a very special program today with our guest Brenda Fleming, the Board of Equalization's Chief Information Officer, and Eric Steen, BOE's Project Director for the Centralized Revenue Opportunity System, fondly known as the CROSS Project. Before we begin, I'd like to take a minute to comment on some pressing issues of the day, as I like to do. Unless you've been asleep the last few weeks, you've heard undoubtedly about the federal government's latest data breach at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, OPM. At a startling congressional hearing this week, the data breach is referred to as catastrophic, devastating, and get this, even deemed more serious to national security than the 9-11 World Trade Center attack. According to one report, this theft involved 30 years of sensitive security clearance, background check information, and personal data from at least 10 million current, past, and prospective federal employees and veterans. The government didn't merely reveal shoddy IT security on the part of its agencies and contractors. It also revealed unforgivable negligence because OPM and the government had known about these security problems for years. They'd already suffered multiple breaches, and they had done little to, or nothing about them. The culprit evidence to date implicates the Chinese Communist government, and it is already being referred to as the Fed's digital Pearl Harbor. The question being asked at the hearing, how was the breach allowed to happen, and could it have been prevented? The question for us here at Tech Leader TV, could this breach happen in California? How many state databases are there? How many contain sensitive personal information on 38 million Californians or confidential financial information about the state's 1 million businesses? Is the data encrypted? Does access require a multi-factor authentication? If not, should the system be shut down, locking out all access until it is? That's what the congressmen and women were saying. These questions need to be asked. Hey, perhaps all is well. But as my old boss, President Reagan, said, trust, but verify. And verification is a never-ending job when it comes to cybersecurity. The Brown administration and the legislature have been busy lately, and congratulations are warranted, again, for getting the budget approved on time this year. But also, the governor, in announcing the accord, called for two special sessions to address important business, one to address health care, the other to discuss funding road and other infra infrastructure repairs. Here at Tech Leader TV, we strongly suggest Governor Brown and the legislature consider a third session on potentially more important business. Is, in light of the digital Pearl Harbor inside the Beltway, with implications around the globe, Tech Leader TV suggests that this session focus on answers to all these cybersecurity questions from appropriate state officials and demand appropriate action. There was a tech surge in Washington, D.C. to salvage the Fed's disastrous healthier.gov rollout. The feds need a cybersecurity surge now, and if warranted, the state of California should not wait to embark on a similar path. Remember, there's two kinds of organizations in, in this brave new world. Those that have been hacked and know it, and those that have been hacked and don't. For more information, check out our website, where we have detailed information about this uh, security breach, and also a link to the, the uh, legislative, the congressional hearing and it should be mandatory viewing for every government director, every government CIO, and CISO. Well, it's an exciting thing, exciting topic today. I'm so excited I'm drooling a little bit up here. But anyway, we'll get back to, the sh to our guests in just a minute. But remember, on, on Tech Leader TV, we always strive to say that California can do better. 
So let's, let's get moving down that road and along this thing of tech, technology, government, politics, and, and, un, and other uh, un uncomfortable acts. We'll talk to you in a few minutes. We'll be right back. Bye-bye for now. Hi, welcome back to Tech Leader TV. Our guests today are, are Brenda Fleming, who's the Chief Information Officer at the Board of Equalization, appointed in 2011. Prior to that, she spent uh, almost 20 years in various roles with the, the legislature, legislature's technology organization, including the State Assembly's IT Division and the Legislative Data Center. Also joining us is Eric Steen, who leads the Board of Equalization's CROSS Project an IT modernization effort we're going to hear a lot more about in the next few minutes. Eric has two, two decades of private sector experience in management consulting and systems integration and work for Deloitte and Trinity Technology Group. Brenda, it's Eric, welcome to Tech Leader TV. Thank we're you. really glad to have you. We had Anna, Anna Brennan on many years ago, but it'd be good to catch up, uh, catch up with uh, what's sure. going on at the Board of Equalization. I know, it, and let's try not to talk about the building, the, the, the building <laughs> disease you have. I'm not going to bring that up. We don't do, that's not a topic for Tech Leader right. TV. But uh, we, do want to, uh, we do want to talk about a number of things with you, and I think I'll just start off a little bit with the, the issue that I spoke of in the monologue, and that's this issue of cybersecurity. It really is a wake-up call for our technology, uh, right. technology officials, and it certainly gets the attention of, of, our, of our supervisors and bosses in, right. in the job. What, what do you think about it? How's, uh, what's, uh, what's Ken Thompson doing over there at, at your CISO? So I know he's joining us yeah. today in the he's audience. He asked me not to call him out today <laughs> as I'm looking right in him for cues on, on what to say, what to not, not to say. It's an issue. It's absolutely an issue, and it's an issue that is universal to everyone, um, government and, uh, and private sector, whether you're at retail or if you're in banking. I mean, it's one of those things that is just sort of permeated throughout every aspect of our lives, just as technology has. Um, we have um, a, a pretty um, uh, extensive uh, information, security, information security program for the State Board of Equalization. We're a revenue agency, clearly, uh, with significant amount of taxpayer information, which includes confidential, private, and um, FTI, federal mm -hmm. tax information. So we take it seriously. We take our role and responsibility seriously mm -hmm. as it relates to trying to protect our taxpayers and citizens of the state mm -hmm. and the composite of that information. So do you feel comfortable that uh, if you were in that congressional hearing, and they were talking about your organization. Mm -hmm. Is the data encrypted? Are you, do you know what your databases are? Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I would feel comfortable, nervous probably, <laughs> going yeah. before Congress. But we, uh, we are unique and have a distinct um, condition at the Board of Equalization because we have five elected, constitutionally elected officials that sit over us. Sure. So we go in and have to brief our board members, which we recently had to do. It sort of felt like we yeah. were going before Congress. Well, we're going to get into that in a minute because I'm very interested right. in that uh, organization because as you, as you know, have told me, it's the only organization of its Correct. kind in the country. There's no other elected board, Correct. I think, uh, that does what you do in any of the other states. Um, one of the things we talked about, and we'll get into this when we get, move over to the CROSS project in particular, is uh, executive sponsorship and mm -hmm. executive, executive relationship. And I was very pleased when I did my homework about the Board of Equalization mm -hmm. that you're, in the, you're on the senior staff. You're one yes. of the top eight or nine people that report into your uh, executive director, uh, Cynthia Bridges, I believe Correct. her name is. Correct. Right. Uh, is she, how is she as an executive uh, champion for technology? She's a, a strong advocate. Um, she's an executive, clearly, and she um, is new to California. Cynthia has a history <laughs> Louisiana, Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken, from, huh? Uh, for many decades there of Louisiana's yeah. Department of Revenue, and so she's done a number of, um, of tax administration projects, modernization efforts. So she's uh, rolled her sleeves up before mm -hmm. and has been in the, immersed in it, so she understands you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of major projects. So she has, is a strong advocate. Eric has a direct reporting relationship because we do take it seriously. Mm -hmm. We understand that um, the executive director and the entire executive team has the responsibility to rally all the resources around, you know, uh, one of our significant projects. So she's actively involved. We have regular meetings. Um, uh, 
constant. I probably have briefings with her on a daily basis right. about a range of things, including how we're doing. My department is getting ready for, for CROSS. So she's active, she's supportive, mm -hmm. um, is as a voice that represents also the sponsorship that comes from our elected officials. Right. So. Well, moving over to Eric for a second, sure. tell me about that executive. Let talk. Give, tell me a little bit about the project first, v just a briefly, sure. and then we'll just get a into brief this. Just sketch. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, why is Cross? Why is why that is Cross? <laughs> well, we really we have three objectives. Okay, three objectives. The first one is to improve the taxpayer experience, and let me just briefly talk about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have we talk a lot about big data we have uh, if somebody figured out if you turned every single data point in our primary system into a penny you can go to the moon not once not twice but 400 times 400 times we have that much data so what we did is we sifted through all that data and we did big data analytics and you know what we discovered we discovered that the average taxpayer doesn't want to spend a lot of time with us did you, figure, did you get that <laughs> i was surprised too so the problem is there's some Taxpayers really just want to register businesses, they want to pay their taxes, and they want a single version of the, of the information. So mm -hmm. what do they need to know to be able to do those things? So that's one of the things that CROSS is going to do, is help, it, help taxpayers remit their taxes, do registration, that sort of thing. So that's the first objective. Secondly, we want to improve internal operations. So we have some, some pretty old technology and some antiquated processes, so we want to really focus on that, bring sure. that up, up to speed. Like, up any, to speed. Any, project. like any project. project. What's the third? And the third one is to generate increased revenue. That generate makes revenue. Sense. Yeah. And, well, and, and, we that's, that, and that's an important topic yes. that we'll get to right. as we move into this. But let me just back up a little bit. And sure. I got to go back and forth, so mm -hmm. everybody give me a little patience here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, tell us about the, the uh, Board of Legalization, some of the metrics. How many, how many, what's your budget? What's your IT budget, your staff, that kind of thing? So the Board of Equalization established in 1879, clearly is established in that time frame, uh, believe it or not, when people say equalizing what? We were equalizing property, uh, the taxation on property. And over time, we started to expand to other levels of tax. So we've got sales and use tax, et cetera. Oh, that organization, our BOE, now has uh, close to just a little under 5,000 employees mm -hmm. um, throughout the state of California. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, district offices. There's four equalization districts, so there's district and field offices throughout the state. We also have out-of-state offices. So we've got Chicago, Houston, and New York. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they represent various businesses, as businesses may do business in California, but they have you know, sure. offices clearly externally. Um, the IT organization, I have uh, ranges between 250, about 300 people, give and take, ebbs and flows, and the IT budget for us is uh, roughly around 10% of, okay. uh, of our budget. 10% uh, of the 10% of the agency's okay. budget. Okay. And that agency budget, as I recall, was about $600 million. So Pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and yeah, you mentioned about now, Eric, Eric has a special relationship. He, I, assume, mm -hmm. I assume your people work on the project, but he has a special reporting relationship mm -hmm. with... Uh, uh, your executive director? Mm -hmm. Right, so the, the board members, um, I mean, they're very interested in making sure the constituents <coughs> get, their constituents get a really good product at the end of CROSS. Oh. And so they really wanted to make sure that the project got all the support that it needed. So they, what they did was they said, let's make sure the project director works directly for the executive director so that way if there are any issues, any challenges, the executive director is apprised of them and then can take a, a action accordingly. That's very interesting because I don't know of any other IT project in the country mm -hmm. and uh, you know been former president of the state CIO association NASIO and right. keep up with many of my former colleagues uh, there. I don't I don't recall anything like that. how's that relationship working out Brenda? We're like siblings. That's awesome. <laughs> we're like siblings. <laughs> That's okay. So, That's okay. You can right? tell us. Yeah, we're like siblings. Yeah. So I come from a family of eight. <clears throat> I got four brothers, so I'm used to, and there are days when we love each other to death, and there's other days when he wants to throw me out of the window, and I want to throw him out about ten windows. Um, but that we wouldn't have, be the only thing <laughs> falling out of that building. <laughs> Boy, you walk we're right into that We're supposed to talk about that. that. <laughs> walk right into it. Sucker myself yeah. into that one. <laughs> But at the end of the day, I think what we share is a rich history in, in professionalism and in information technology mm -hmm. and a, a passion about um, not being mediocre mm -hmm. and giving our best, doing our best, and pushing <coughs> the envelope so that we at the Board of Equalization, and we were brought on about a month apart, I think what we really look to is looking at trying to transform the Board of Equalization and any of our leadership roles in California to think more like private industry a bit mm -hmm. so that we're pushing the envelope, so that we're not the classic, you know, the old school stereotypical, you're just a government agency. We don't have that sort of philosophy. Right. So I think we share philosophies. We maybe have different approaches, just two different views on the world, different mm -hmm. roles. But even with that, 
that when we have you know challenges with how the approach is, we find ways to either debating it, arguing it, or just saying okay, and then we kind of yeah. work it out. Are you so is BOE actually healthy. considered a constitutional office? Yes. Okay. Yes. So like the other ones, you are you have an elected board plus right. a, a Betty Betty Yee, the state controller, right, is automatically a member. Exactly. That's five at of them. Large, then? Correct. Five of them. Yeah. Okay. And inter yeah, interesting. Like I say, only one in the country like right. that. Uh, is uh, and the cross project is the epitome, I would assume, of a mission critical project. Yes. Right. I didn't notice any other major uh, IT projects in the CIO office reporting a tracking system. Correct. But you must have other uh, initiatives. Can you tell absolutely. us a little about the current ones that you're sure, doing? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the the portfolio of IT projects or just business transformation projects for the board is, is healthy. Cross is one of them and, and clearly one of the more significant ones, but we are all also involved in Fiscal. We originally were a Wave 1 organization um, and I th uh, eventually got moved through some of the detailed planning and analysis there, got moved to Wave 4. Um, because while Fiscal is implementing, you know, accounting, budgeting, et cetera, revenue accounting has got a little bit of a different leg to it. So there's different rules. And as we immersed ourselves into the Wave 1 activities, we started to discover that that maybe wasn't the best approach in time for us. Is so, that just another way of saying the project's been delayed? We've been moved to Wave 4. Moved to Wave 4. But there are a number of others. Um, we have a significant number of legislative mandates that are introduced to us on an annual basis. Uh, most of those will then go through the legislative process and have effective dates of that next January. So mm -hmm. the governor typically signs them in the September, October time frame, mm -hmm. and we typically have to turn on either turning up or turning down, you know, tax rates or some new tax program by the effective date of next January. So right now my portfolio probably has e easily above the line probably 20, 30 projects in it. Okay. Above the line being about 900, pretty complex, okay. consuming a lot of resources. The challenge is, as a footnote <coughs> that we're trying to address in that portfolio is when you have two major projects like Cross and Fiscal and a number of pieces of legislation that are brand new, the challenge that we have is how do you start to contain and, you know, it's like anything else, how do you juggle the balls mm -hmm. and try yeah. to allocate and commit resources? So well, it's quite uh, full. As, as we mentioned in the monologue, the governor and the legislature have agreed on a new budget for the right. fiscal year 2016. Right. Um, what's new in there for Board of Equalization in terms of IT business? Um, Any new projects? That not, well, we, we didn't do a lot for, for other, because our commitment right now and priority is in cross and fiscal. So we're very careful not to take on, at our request, any new sets of activities. Okay. Um, what's new in the governor's budget for us is a lot of these pieces of legislation. And a number of them are introducing uh, what we refer to as a new tax activity, tax activity type. So in general, though, the things that might be sexy that you hear about in the news could be things like taxation proposals and discussions about you know, taxation on mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. um, taxation on marijuana, how are you going to deal with those kinds of issues. So there are a number of things that are there on the horizon um, that would be new for us um, and an extension of us. The others are just, you know, just continuing mm -hmm. to either increase or decrease taxation um, and, you know, minor adjustments to the existing tax programs. We've okay. got about 30 tax programs currently. Okay. And just one more thing about your organization. So uh, just who's on your senior staff? In terms of inside TSD yeah, or I, the TSD inside, and uh, named individuals or not necessarily. Well, yeah. sure. We, so I'm just curious uh, how they or, how you're organized. Sure, sure. So my organization is is um, in partnership with Cross and also partners with the ISO. Under me, as I'm a CIO, but I'm also deputy director for the technology services mm -hmm. department. And so I have a number of divisions under me, app traditional model, applications development, infrastructure services, production support services, et cetera, our enterprise planning, mm -hmm. our project management office. Um, recently, the thing that I've done is stood up as we're, we're strengthening our ITSM capabilities, we've stood up a business relationship management model. And so we're standing more of that up to try to implement more of the, the, the rich practices, traditional practices that we're going to need to support the modern organization, um, doing more with metrics, mm -hmm. uh, performance metrics, and really trying to expand more in our web services. So we've kind of just restructuring the organization, mm -hmm. not just within the technology services mm -hmm. department, but agency-wide to accommodate the changes that Cross sure. is going to drive us to along with Fiscal. Right. Okay, let's shift over to Fiscal. I mean, to uh, like cross, love to talk about Fiscal too. <laughs> yeah. another, that's another yeah. show. Sure. Yeah. Uh, on, on Cross, because uh, again, a mission critical system and so much riding on it. And uh, you, uh, you have a different approach, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. We want to talk about that. Uh, you know, it's a major project. I think a three hundred million dollar budget. Right. If there's any complaints out there, they're saying, "Why is it so?" Let's get right to it. Why is the procurement? Why is this taking so long, Eric? It's been a couple <laughs> of years, and it's. I guess. Well, that's the other thing. I think the proposals were due this month, this last week. This week, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken. And that has that been put off that's again? That's been moved out again. Okay, yes. so yeah. what? 
Let's hear your side of the story. Uh, okay, well, there's only so much I can say about the procurement right. timeline. Um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that uh, we're, we're ready, that we're, that. I'm, let me sure. just clarify, who's actually doing the procurement? Is it the t statewide technology yeah, procurement division? Yes, it's mm -hmm. they're over the procurement, but then we also have uh, Department of Technology's oversight body in as well, mm -hmm. and so they tend to work together. And, and really, the procurement timeline, the procurement dates are, they, they, they drive those things. Mm -hmm. So, Do I sense some bitterness there? Oh, I don't know if you sense bitterness. <laughs> um, I think sometimes there are... You can. That's things. what the show's for, yeah, right. Eric. Is, is this really is this yeah. supposed to be like a cathartic <laughs> yeah, thing? Yeah, I can right. just kind of unload so here. We're all in counseling um, here. Yeah, we always yeah. say nobody's ever gotten right. fired after they've been on the show, but there's <laughs> always the first time. Yeah. No, I, you know, I mean, I think in fairness to all parties involved, there is a, there's a strong commitment to do things right to want to not right. make mistakes, to mm -hmm. want to succeed. We don't have the right. best, unfortunately, we don't have the best track record in the public sector as right. it, as it uh, pertains to sure. IT delivery. And so there is a lot of interest in not repeating past mm -hmm. mistakes. Right. Um, sometimes that translates into dates getting moved reason, for reasonable reasons. And sometimes I think there's dates that get moved. In my opinion, we don't need to move them, but that's it's not my call. Part right. of the process. So, but to be fair, it's, it's all designed uh, it's all motivated by a desire to do right by the taxpayer and actually have a successful outcome. And, and uh, what's the latest? What are the proposals do now? I think it was just an addendum came out this week. Addendum. Right. Well, there's addendum 16, which I think is coming out today or tomorrow, and that will mm -hmm. shift the dates uh, for final proposals again. Okay. So it will it be next month, the uh, following month? Uh, um, I, I don't we're looking for scoops here on this show. Yeah, you know? This won't get you in any trouble. Will it? It won't get in any trouble. Well, I think, uh, <laughs> suffice it to say, uh, it's going to be moved out. I can't give you a specific date. Okay. It's some actually, future date. Yeah, some, some future, future date. date, right? Okay. Right. Okay. Some future date. Yeah. It, very helpful. Sure. Uh, we, probably well, not, but okay. Wait till, wait till, wait till, wait till lunch <laughs> afterwards. <for everybody. laughs> yeah. right. uh, well, so that's, a, that's certainly, a, I mean, all of us at this table have been through multi-year procurements and know how difficult oh, yeah. it is. And there's, I remember when, I remember when we did uh, our Massachusetts version of CalNet when I was CIO there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just apoplectic waiting on the <laughs> lawyers and everybody else to give it their seal of approval. And I know it drags out and there's really nothing you can do about it, but it, it's very frustrating not only for, but you can imagine what it must be for these vendors. And speaking of which, that's the, that's the real rub here. The state's mm -hmm. been under a number of issues over the last 10, 15 years now, not getting enough bids. And we know from uh, Jeff Kostick, my associate at Tech Leader TV, uh, we know that the board is very interested in making sure you have multiple bidders on this. Right. And that's always very difficult sometimes to do in this latest environment because mm -hmm. of the risk involved. Right. right. So uh, do you feel comfortable you're going to get more than one vendor to uh, I feel send like in a proposal? I feel it'll be a competitive bid. Okay. Yes. And I'm hopeful it'll be a competitive bid. It'll be healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Euphemistically speaking, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that, that's that's good. I yeah. no, I appreciate that, and we we would like to see it because obviously there's there's always pitfalls. We only get one right. bid, and it makes things difficult, particularly right. in the legislature's eyes. And I'm you're sure your board, and right. not to mention the media and, and, and the public. Right. Uh, well, um, over the course of the the, the the time period, which is a couple years of mm -hmm. this, has there been a, how how difficult has it been to uh, keep the consistency and the enthusiasm for this project going within your 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 two organizations. Uh, yeah. That's a challenge, isn't it's, it? It is a challenge. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a I mean, I, I joined three and a half years ago. I, I didn't think I'd still be in procurement <laughs> at this point. I mean, to be honest, truth be told. <laughs> I bet. And I'm not sure, and no one else did. In fact, if you go back and look at the original feasibility study, we're, we're way off from whatever. I don't know what they were doing when they put those We've done together. our research. <laughs> yeah, all right. So we didn't want to embarrass you, though. The, the, the important thing is to really stay positive, um, use that time judiciously, make sure that, I mean, the reality is I went into the procurement knowing that it wasn't going to be done in six months or a year or two years. Um, it's going to take, it was going to take a long time. So our strategy was to harvest that you time. You thought the procurement would take two years? Um, I was hopeful that it would take no more than yeah. two years. I knew it would take a long time. Um, it's What's the biggest stumbling block? Uh, right now? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm not in general. I mean, is it anything to do with the fact that this is a cost, uh, sh a, what is it called, Co a savings, share savings type of project? As yeah. Share savings is where, you know, just the audience is where the vendor is going to be paid, not necessarily at a time and materials, but actually is going to be paid out of the increase in revenues that the system will generate. Very, un very um, um, 
uh, relatively unusual in government, mm -hmm. but it's something the state of California has done back before I got here in 96. Mm -hmm. uh, FTB right. did one, and it was uh, ACES and, and, and one or two others, and now yours. So has that been one of the holdups? I wouldn't be surprised because we it's had a hell of a time getting I mean, into the To be honest, it's, been, it's factored in, but there's, it's, there's many reasons things. why yeah. things get pushed around. Right. Uh, and, and really, it's a, it's a conversation to have with the State Technology Procurement Division mm -hmm. and, and their oversight Where's body. Where's Russ Warner when we need him? I mean, huh? He's over there somewhere, but he's, yeah, he's exactly. Um, I, I mean, realistically, I, I, to be fair, people really want to do it right. And so there's just a lot of increase increased activity in certain areas which mm -hmm. take take more time um, the latest if you watch the board hearing the BOE the latest um, interest is in developing an integrated master schedule and and Department of Technology feels very strongly that until this integrated schedule that forecasts activities that the vendors are going to be doing is completed and they're satisfied with it mm -hmm. um, they really feel like hey we should we should wait to before we move forward with the the mm -hmm. receipt of final proposals mm -hmm. and the implementation is it true is it true by the way that the vendor will not be paid until these uh, savings or new revenues are generated period right that's so the way it's, that's the way it's so that and that yeah. would it, right. right off the top that right. would take at least six months a year into the project and most likely it yeah. would, it'll take some time so that's another right. reason why it's, it's sometimes difficult to get the uh, yeah. players to step up to the table the vendors i mean it's very now let me ask you a question as sure. i mentioned there's been other projects most notably i guess would be edr or right. franchise tax board right what what have you learned what were the what have you learned from kathy cleek and her team on their project, which has been in place now for four or five years, I guess, and you know, obviously they've got the billion-dollar savings that they're uh, they're yelling from the rooftops, and that's great. And that's uh, hopefully, what have, what have you learned from that project? What are some of the things you've been able to incorporate into yours? And what are the things, maybe, maybe even better, what are the things you don't want to do? Right, right. So I think in the, in the partnership, there's learning and, and lessons learned and um, you know, tips of the trade on both sides. So from a project perspective, and Eric can get down to that detail. Well, we've tried to glean from EDR and, you know, projects at EDD and Breeze, other projects, et cetera, is, you know, when you're going through two sides of it, when you're getting through the readiness, the organizational readiness, and so from an IT perspective, what we're looking for is we understand at some point when that project is what I call, and my staff are calling a laugh at me, when the baby's given birth, <laughs> so when the baby's born, um, there's going to be a lot of activity that will, IT staff will be involved in there. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make sure that we're taking advantage of, to your point earlier, this time that we have during the procurement to try to get those things ready. Mm -hmm. So what are the environments going to look like? What are the, you know, our operational practices? We're going to have to revisit our, you know, our service level agreements. I mean, there's just a whole number of things. How are, you know, um, our policies in place? Um, how mm -hmm. do we prepare the staff? You know, we're shifting. We don't know what the solution is going to be yet. But, but any, anything need specific sure. to the experiences of EDR or any of these other projects that you've been able to well, Eric use speak or, to or, I, or want to avoid? Well, I, I, so, so I think for me the challenge is, is to, to clarify that there are some similarities between what we're doing with CROSS and EDR, but there's probably more differences. Mm -hmm. And so you pick up nuggets here and there in terms of project organization, you know, what worked and didn't work and looking for some efficiencies, but they really are, believe it or not, not as, <clears throat> and you can speak to it, not as directly um, um, comparable as one would okay. think. Okay. So there's certainly, I think, from an administration perspective, yes, um, but the more we're digging into the project, the more you realize that it's a different well, we'll kind have of to a ask, project. We should have Kathy Cleek here. I'd love to ask, what right. if you had sure. to do over? What would you right. do differently? There's got to be a number of them. What I admire I about them yeah, is, is a couple things. There are some things there to learn. Yeah, no, I, what I admire about them, a couple things. One, I, I, think they do a, I think they do a reasonably good job of being transparent and, and marketing their successes. Okay, so I think they do a really good, in fact, anytime I'm down at the legislature and I hear um, the Franchise Tax Board goes forward to, to uh, give testimony on the project, I think they do a really good job at that. So I, I, I applaud them for that. The other thing I, I really like about Franchise Tax Board is the dedication that they bring to the, the project. I mean, they really have, I mean, if you look at the amount of budget, you look at the amount of resources, they're very much taking it very seriously. And it's not something, there's not anemic support for it. So they really, really emphasize the need to get it done and get it mm -hmm. done right. So right. I, I think those are two big takeaways. Mm -hmm. um, but as I would echo what Brenda's saying is we're very different projects in terms of what they're doing functionally right. is very different from what we're doing functionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Different mm -hmm. types of yeah. products. And again, we can't, we can't diminish the, the significance 
of the different support organizations. And so there are some things that, that, you know, again, FTB, and we talk about it pretty regularly, that they are able to do that we have to do it differently because we do have uh, a broader range of tax programs with a different cadence of our operational activities. You know, if, you know when you're looking at income tax, et cetera, versus sales tax, sales tax, the machinery around sales tax moves daily. Mm -hmm. So we've got to deposit funds every single day. And so right. there's just some differences in how we're structured and how we have to go forward and therefore how we can commit to the project. Mm -hmm. We're so, a much better organization is what right? you're saying. <laughs> 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 All right. Enough of the cheerleading. Healthy competition, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, so um, one thing I, I wanted to talk about, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, com we've compared the two, but um, is because I was saying, you know, it's there's a there's a good marketing machine it seems behind the FTB, mm -hmm. right. and uh, legitimately they seem to have really yeah. uh, hit the nail on the head with right. their with their project. When you talk about that savings and compared to some of the other projects we've right. seen around the states. We'd like to see more of this this uh, this cost savings sharing, if you will. Right. Um, and when you deal with the legislature, uh, do you do you have to deal with the legislature like other offices do? Mm -hmm. I mean, do they ask about this? What's the legislature's mm -hmm. feeling about projects of this kind? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> Are they supportive? I mean, they're yes. they obviously your bu your budget. I think comes out of the general fund, if I'm not mistaken. It's a mix yeah. of yeah. general yeah, and special fund. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a mix. So it's, they've been supportive of it. I, I think they've been very yeah. supportive, uh, incredibly supportive, and I think largely because we are taking a different approach than most IT projects. Mm -hmm. So, as I mentioned, we do have all this time that's mm -hmm. that's really available to us mm -hmm. in terms of the procurement. And right. so, most projects simply you know, they write the FSR, they put together the RFP, they conduct a procurement. At the end of that. I would argue that most organizations really aren't ready for implementation. So what we did was let's do what we call pre-implementation and just one aspect of the pre-implementation is the procurement. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, or in parallel, we're taking on activities related to data conversion, data migration, our interfaces, documenting right. our, our requirements and our business rules very thoroughly and making sure that we've under, we understand all the systems that are in scope of replacement and understand mm -hmm. all the functionality that needs to be replaced and we've developed the subject matter expertise necessary so that when the vendor shows up, we're not counting on them to, to learn our system, our business, our data. We actually have that expertise in-house. Yeah. These guys are battle-hardened, they're ready, and they're gonna work alongside with the vendor to get these things are you completed. Are you using any vendors in this pre-implementation project? A little bit, project? yeah, a few. What, Where what we, kind, what, what for? Sure, so in the area of, a good example is in data conversion. Um, and in fact, the reason we jumped in front of this years ago, before I joined the BOE, I ran into an executive from State Controller's office. This was when uh, Mike Calpes was going along, and and he said we, we refer to that as a 22nd century 22nd project century, yes, <laughs> on this show. So I, we ran into him and said, "Hey, would you like to you know meet meet with us for lunch?" And 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 he he said uh, he, he said he was just coming out of the legislature. Mm -hmm. And he said, we just got another year added to the 21st century project. I think this was around 2010. Mm -hmm. And it was that conversation that had me thinking, well, what can we do? What can the state of California do so that when it gets into the implementation and you realize, oh my goodness, this data is just confusing and I can't get it into sh my shiny new system. What can you do before the vendor even shows up so that you right. don't have that problem? And that really kind of gave rise to the approach that we're taking. And that's where we needed some specialized help. That's where we brought in some consultants um, who have a lot of experience in California, getting data cleaned up, getting it organized, getting it well documented so that, so that we, and what we're doing is actually putting, putting in place data quality rules mm -hmm. so we can evaluate the quality of the yep. data, fixing it. We fixed 11 million, <clears throat> 11 million production data issues already. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just, and that's before the vendor shows up, got it staged. And so that way it's much easier to get it, get it into the right. new system. And I seem to recall we had this conversation before the show mm -hmm. about, you know, I was asking about the re-engineering of the system. Well, how much mm -hmm. of re-engineering is going on because so much of that, rather than just, right. uh, you know, painting over rust, you're actually improving the way you're doing your, right. your business rules, your business processes. Right. I would assume a lot, that's a lot of what you're talking about Absolutely. is going into this. Mm -hmm. It must be a little difficult to juggle between the procurement side and this implementation side because Let's face it, those things you're finding and discovering and fixing right. on the pre-implementation right. could right. affect the procurement. Right. right. We'll, blame, we'll blame the delay on that. Sure. How's that? Well, <laughs> well, what happens is you go into your implementation and then you, you have no idea how big the bread box is, right? Mm -hmm. So exactly. you get in there and you realize, oh my goodness, <coughs> we have all this data that we archived that went to you know, our customers for correspondence. What are we going to do with that? Mm -hmm. Well, 
that will probably translate into a change order unless you figure out a way right. to mitigate that up front or put requirements in your RFP or, or solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And so what we're really trying to understand is what are all those landmines that we're going to run into and solve them now? Because surprises, surprise, people don't like surprises. So if we come in and say... Especially our electeds. Yeah, especially elected officials. It doesn't look good when we say, oh, we thought it was going to be you know, a $50 million project or a twenty million or you know, $200 million project, and it turns out to be a ha you know, half a billion. So the more we know about the issues sure. and can either address them or cost them and put them into the RFP, the better off we are and, and the fewer the, 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 uh, those surprises. Yeah. We only have a few more minutes, so a couple of the, the, uh, the what is it, the uh, action round here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what do you do about vendors? How are vendors, how do vendors approach you? If you have an open door, you take meetings? Yes, I do. People can get fact, in to I see you? A significant amount of time. Uh, uh, with as vendors we all, and the community, as, as we, we all, all do. Yeah. Um, it, it's important. The way, it's important. And the way I treat it is I do it two levels. For me, it's a way of partnering with my community because we're a part of the community. And so I do want to make sure that we're working um, you know, to give vendors an opportunity also. We mm -hmm. all, I use it to stay on top of trends and new technology and what's new, et cetera. We're in a transformational state mm -hmm. for the Board of Equalization, and we do mean to modernize our organization. The second tier for me is I like to bring the vendors in to make sure they're spending time with staff. Yeah. Um, again, to use those for training opportunities. Sure. Um, sure. So the, the, a little bit of the history for our organization is the legacy system that we use today is a legacy system, which means it works, and it's moving money every day, but it's a 1990 model, right? right? So right. we have to make the time and the gap between where we are in terms of the legacy system to where we want to be mm -hmm. is a significant number of years. Right. And so what we're also doing is using those vendor relationships and those opportunities to help to, help to get the staff's thinking um, and their thought leadership to try to yeah, move it because right. it's a significant gap for right. us to overcome. So, Eric, only, a, only a minute or so left. Sure. What's your message to the vendors out there that are interested in the cross project? I know you can't uh, talk to them about the project. What do you tell the vendor community about the project if you were just giving a speech? You know, I took, I took this job for two reasons. One, I really wanted to see the state of California succeed, and I want to set, ex set an example of how we can do things better mm -hmm. and actually have successes. So let's work together, let's partner on that, and let's change the trajectory of IT projects in the state of California. We, we can do it. And please submit a bid. And please, yeah, please submit, submit a bid. bid. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. And be patient. Well, be patient. Yes, be patient. Be patient. You'll need, you need some patience. Well, uh, that's going to conclude our program today. We're very, very, uh, very excited. Uh, we're going to take up a few of these more provocative issues at our reception in a few minutes. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please check out our website. Watch that video on that hearing at the congressional hearing on, uh, right. on the data breach. That's important for all of us in this community. Uh, keep checking the website for other updates. I know we've got a poll co going on that I hope everybody's going to try their, try their luck at. We've got a great new uh, schedule coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we've got Russ Nichols from CDCR. We've got Elaine Howell from the State Auditor's Office. That should be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And plus, uh, our, our good friend and friend of Tech Leader TV, Chris Cruz, the new uh, Chief Deputy mm -hmm. at, uh, at the State CI's office, will join us, as will Andrea Roman Wallen. Uh, we're going to hear more about that STAR, star project. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all mu very Take much, and we'll see you next month. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.